country caravan that's tremendous it's great to have this in our day and time I can remember back a few years ago when basically I sang on a Sunday night <laughs> I think we've come up since then but anyway <laughs> well let's lead us in this song that's in your program tonight the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in our Lord let's stand to sing it
Good. You may be seated. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Dorothy. And thank you, Tony. <laughs> Boy, that's the first time I've done that. It used to be other names. All righty. How about turning to Colossians chapter 2 tonight? The subject is complete in him. We just sang about it. Now we're going to look at what the Word has to say about it. Colossians chapter 2. And in verse 10, and it's covered in this book that Dr. Earl wrote called The Bible Tells Me so, so. It's volume one in Studies in, the, in Abundant Living. And this uh, has a tremendous chapter in here that explains this verse and a lot of things about it in the context and what it means to us today. But Colossians chapter 2. This, about a week ago, I had just finished a camp in... Uh, Gunnison, Camp Gunnison, the Way Family Ranch, Colorado, and it was a joy for Reverend Dubofsky, the uh, Northeast Region Coordinator of the United States, and myself to uh, be the spiritual coordinators and teachers of this uh, particular camp. We had around 150 people there, and it was a joy to uh, work with these individuals for that whole week, and uh, share our lives with one another, learned a lot of things from them, and we in turn taught the Word. Reverend Dubofsky shared on the subject of sonship rights. The, the key, or the uh, theme to the week was uh, your key to power. So he shared on your sonship rights. That's part of your key to power. And I shared on the renewed mind. And that is the other part of your key to power. Both those things dovetailed into... Uh, helping them to understand how to have more power in their lives from a spiritual point of view. And got to thinking about um, our lives and how those sonship rights that he taught really give you the credentials in life for who you are today. It's not your education, not your uh, pedigree, not your background in any way or your training uh, in the world but it's your rights as God's son, your sonship rights that give you the credentials that you need in life today to spiritually move with God. I, of course, have my bachelor's and my master's degree, and I had a couple opportunities to go on and work on my doctorate, but I've declined so far to do that. I'd much rather major in... God's Word and rightly dividing that and really understanding it. And that, would, that gives me spiritual credentials, which I think is more important than all the secular credentials in the world. Uh, but I had to make that decision. And yet, if somebody wants to go on and work further and have those other credentials, that's fine too. But the real credentials are the spiritual credentials that you have in God's Word. And Reverend Dubofsky taught on your rights as a son of God, and one line that he shared on Wednesday evening, I remember that, it was kind of a tough evening, but he was marvelous as a teacher and uh, really shared the greatness of it. Uh, but he closed with this line, referring to our sonship rights, or specifically it was justification that night, a right of justification. You don't work for it. You work with him because you have it. In other words, you don't work for your justification. You work with God because you have justification. God has already justified you. You stand before his court without any sin. You've been clean. You know, your slate has been clean. You don't have any charges to be laid against you. Romans 8 tells you that. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? There's nothing against you. You've been justified. So you don't have to work for that justification. Understand? It's by grace, it says. By grace. You don't have to work for it. But you work for him or work with him because you have been justified by him. And I thought that was a tremendous line. You do have a reason for working today. It's not to be justified, but it's because you've been justified. Because you've been justified, why not really work with him and walk with him and serve in this day and time? I thought that was a tremendous line. It applies to all your sonship rights. You're righteous, right? You don't have to work for righteousness. You are righteous, so why not work with him who made you righteous? 
the one that made you righteous. You're sanctified, set apart. You have a special elite group that you belong to, God's group. You're sanctified. You're set apart, holy. Therefore, do you have to work for that sanctification? No, it's by grace. You don't have to work for it, but you work with him because you have it. You have the ministry of reconciliation. Do you have to work to earn that right to be an ambassador and to be able to represent God in that ministry of reconciling others to God, to bring others back to him? No, because he's given you that right as a son of God. Now, because you have it, work with him. What a line, I thought. In Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 10, it says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in Christ. Complete, absolutely complete. You have everything that you need. You don't have to work for it. You have it, it says. It doesn't say work to be complete, does it? doesn't say you really have to pray a lot to be complete. It says you are complete. At least that's what this Bible says. I hope yours says the same thing. And it does in every critical Greek text and Aramaic text too. It says the same thing. You are complete, absolutely complete, in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now, that word, you, the words you are complete, in the Aramaic, are a form of the word that is called the extra-extensive form. The extra-extensive form. Uh, there are three forms that are normally used. This is the fourth one. It's a rare form. It is used somewhat in the New Testament, but not as regularly as the other forms. And it really intensifies the meaning of that word. Uh, the best way to translate it and the way Dr. Weir will translate it in this book is you are absolutely or completely, completely, completely complete. <laughs> You're absolutely complete. That's the intensity of that word. You are absolutely complete or completely, 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 totally complete in your work, in your church your denomination, in the way international. No, in me. Nope, sorry. <laughs> in who? Him, Christ. You're complete in him. Now the word in Greek, in the critical Greek text and all the manuscripts, is plerao that we've had many times before. Plerao means filled to capacity, where you're complete in the sense that you are totally full. You have everything that you absolutely need. And it's used in the perfect tense in Greek if you want some of the technical details, which means it's completed action. You have absolutely everything that you need. So whichever trans or version you want to look at, Aramaic or Greek, it's really intensified in saying that you are absolutely complete in that you have everything that you need in Him, Christ. Not in yourself, not in somebody else, but in Christ because of what he's done for you. And, or in him, which is the head of all principality and power. The word head is significant. It's a, one of the key concepts in the book of Colossians because they had a little problem with heads um, at Colossae. Uh, you know, it's sort of like you know, different groups have different individuals at the heads of their groups. One group sets up one person as their head. Somebody else sets somebody else up as their head. So you've got multiple heads. What well, says there's one head? One head, and that head is whom? Christ. He is the head of all principality and power. And that is a theme throughout this entire book, that Christ is the head of the church, that one body, and the head of all principality and power. He's the head. Uh, they had another problem in that they had different heads for different things in their culture. They would have one angel that's responsible for one particular thing or a devil spirit or whatever. They had one God responsible for this, one God responsible for that, one saint responsible for this, one angel responsible for that. Um, all different heads for different responsibilities. 
You don't have different heads. If my body had more than one head on it, I'd have a problem. We'd have to negotiate every time we wanted to decide which way we wanted to go. Maybe one of my heads would want to go to a movie and the other one would want to go, you know, to High Country Caravan. Then I'd have a problem, wouldn't I? <laughs> well, you got one head. And who's the head? Christ. Aren't you glad I'm not your head? <laughs> all right. Christ is the head of that body. He is the head of all principality and power. Now, in Colossians 1, just across the page in my book here, verse 18, it says, and he, that's Christ, is the head. See that? He's the head of the body. He's the head of the body, the church. The body is the church. The church of the body is the believers today. This is part of it sitting in here. Many others around the world and in other centuries at different times. But we're the body of Christ, the church. And Christ is the head of that one body who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the what? Preeminence. Not that a lot of different angels or a lot of different saints or a lot of different devil spirits or something else have the headship. There's one head that has the preeminence, not many different heads. And at Colossae, they had a problem with it. Look at chapter 2, verse 18. <clears throat> Let no man beguile you of your reward. Beguile you or cheat you out of your reward. The rewards are those things you get when Christ returns because of the work that you've done today. When you do things in accordance with God's word and will, you'll be rewarded for it in the future. You already have an inheritance coming if you're born again, but the, and that's by grace. But the work that you do today, as you walk with him, you know, why not walk with him, as Reverend Abofsky said, then in the future, you're going to be rewarded for it. But if, you, if somebody talks you out of doing those things that are in accord with God's word, you're going to have very few rewards in the future. You get to sit down in the entrance, but what about the living room, the kitchen? Or I, want, I want to get to the kitchen. <laughs> Let no man beguile you, talk you out of it, your reward in a voluntary humility. You know, it looks humble, but it's really not. And there's a lot of people like that. You know, it's a false sense of humility. And the worshiping of what? Angels. Didn't I tell you they were worshiping different heads, different angels? They had different angels responsible for different jobs. You know, one responsible for death, one responsible for sickness, one responsible for childbirth, you know, all those different things. Different angels, different heads. Worshiping of angels. You worship God and his son, Jesus Christ. You honor him. But they were worshiping angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Most of the critical Greek texts don't have the word not here. Some of them added it at a point, but most of them read, intruding into those things which he has seen. The things that he sees by his five senses rather than walking spiritually. You know what gears most people's actions from a spiritual con uh, point of view or context? is what they see with their five senses. They go by their experiences rather than by what the Word says. They, they venture into those things that they've seen with their five senses. They don't go by what the Word says. This is revelation from God. Now, when you try out God's Word, it works, and you see the results in the five senses area, and it never fails. But if I go by your experiences, they may not work for me. Your experiences, that's fine for you, but what if I try it out and it doesn't work? Everybody's experiences could give you different ideas, different philosophy, but not when you go by the Word. The Word, then, will give you all experiences that line up and have integrity, and they work time after time. I'd rather go by God's word than by the experiences of man and the words of man, man's tradition. 
I think it says something about that in the Word. He, he goes by those things that he has seen, vainly puffed up by his what? Fleshly mind, the mind of the senses, not the spiritual mind. And, verse 19, not holding the head. Who is the head? Christ. Christ is the head of the body. Christ is the head of the body, but they want to work out all these things by their five senses. They've got angels for different responsibilities, but they don't want to hold that one head, Christ. We've got to uphold that one head, Jesus Christ. He's the head of the body. From which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. It's that one head that gives increase to this body of Christ. One head, Christ, and that supplies the nourishment for the rest of the body. Not several heads, not many angels, saints or anything else. One head, and that head is Christ. Now back to Colossians 2, verse 10. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You see that? So if we have that head, Christ, one head, then we have that completeness, not only spiritually, but in manifestation. And we have that head, Christ, not only as the head of the body externally, but it says he is in us in Colossians 1.27. 127, to whom God would make known what is the poverty of the glory of this, oh, I'm sorry, what is the what? Riches, the riches of the glory of this mystery. Whenever I read these things, you know, I mention this every once in a while, but it shows you the inability of language to communicate the great heart of God's word. <laughs> you know, we're dealing with man's words that are endeavoring to communicate God's Word. And sometimes it takes some unusual figurative expressions to communicate the magnificence of God's Word. Look at this. The riches of the glory of the mystery. <laughs> we call it a dual genitive in Greek because you've got two genitive constructions. The riches of the glory of the mystery. See? Putting emphasis on it. It's the... Glorious mystery, but it's the riches of it. Yeah, keep your finger here. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. Here's the mystery. How that by revelation he made known unto me the what? The mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, or that mystery pertaining to Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, so did they know it in the Old Testament or Gospel period? No, not until the church age began on the day of Pentecost. That, and it is now revealed, now, unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, here it is, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same, what? Body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So the Judeans and Gentiles could both become a part of that one body, be fellow heirs, partakers of the promise. See that? But look at chapter 2 of Ephesians. That's the mystery, that there'd be one body. In the Old Testament, what did you have? You had Israel, the Judeans, but then you also had the Gentiles out here. The Gentiles could become proselytes of Judaism, but for the most part they were divided. Today it's one body called out of both the Judeans and the Gentiles. One body of Christ. Chapter 2 of Ephesians, uh, verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past, what? Gentiles, nations, they were not of Israel, in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, 
having no hope and without God in the world. But now, now, you Gentiles, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh, you're come near by the blood of Christ. For he, Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one, both who? Judean and Gentile. He's made both of them one and hath broken down the middle wall, that middle wall of partition between us. And by the way, there was a wall in the temple that separated the court of the Gentiles from the court of Israel. He's broken down that wall so that there's one body today, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, of the two, one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God, both who? Judean and Gentile, to God, in one body, one body, the body of Christ, by the cross, having slain me enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. So now instead of two bodies, you've got one body, called out of both Judean and Gentile. It's one, that's the mystery that they all belong to one body with how many heads? One head. And who's that head? Christ. Now back in Colossians 1.27. To whom God would make known what is the mystery? No. The riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. This is the riches of the glory. There's one body, but the riches of the glory of this mystery is, which is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's it. You've got Christ in you. You've got the head in you. <laughs> now think about that for a moment. Christ is the head of the body. There's one body today, not two, but one called out of both Judeans and Gentiles. One body, that body of Christ. Who's the head of the body? Christ. Now look, when you've got a body, uh, for example, you've got a body of workers with you know, any factory set up or a company where you've got people that work down on the floor and then they've got a supervisor and their supervisors have supervisors and managers on up till you get to the vice president, finally the president of the company. So does the worker down here normally go up and talk to the president? No, he talks to his supervisor. Supervisor talks to his supervisor. His supervisor talks to his until finally somebody gets to the president. By that, it's like telephone. You know, the message has changed when it gets there. Well, anyway, <clears throat> you don't have to go through all these channels to get to the head because you have the head where? That's power. To have Christ in you, the head. And there's how many heads? Look, if I've got Christ in me and you've got Christ in you and we're both walking by that same head, could we contradict each other if we're walking? No. <laughs> That's pretty neat. That's why the only way you get unity, it's not an ecumenical movement in the census category, but it's everybody getting that Christ in them and realizing it and then walking by that Christ in you, then you've got some power and some unity in Christianity. Otherwise, you're just talking philosophical ideas, traditions of men. Look at it. Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. That's the riches of the glory of that mystery. Isn't that tremendous? And you've got that head in you. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we ye also appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is our life. Who is our life? Christ. And where is he? In you. That's what gives you life today. You've got that head in you, so you've got a way to live. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. Pretty dynamic. Christ in you. He is our life. Look at verse 10. Well, I better start in verse 8. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing ye have put off the old man with his 
deeds. The old man is that old nature on the outside. And have put on the what? New man. You got a new man? Where is it? Inside that Christ in you. Put on that new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Who created him? In you. God did. And it's renewed in that image. So you take that new man that you have in here, that Christ in you, and you put him on. Where do you put him on? In your toes? No. You put him on in your mind. And you live just like what you've got on the inside. You walk like Christ walked. What did Christ do? He was sort of sad and defeated and frustrated all of his life. No. No, he, he had power and he knew it. He helped people. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He ministered to people's needs. He knew how to bind up their wounds to help them. You live like Christ lived. Tremendous, isn't it? Put on that new man. Where there is neither Greek nor Judean. See, all that's gone. It's one body. Circumcision nor uncircumcision. Barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free you're neither slave nor freeman but christ is all and in all who's all the head he's all and he's where in all that are born again of his spirit that's the riches of the glory of the mystery you've got the head christ in you look at verse 15 and let the peace of god rule in your hearts the most of the critical greek texts have let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, which fits well in the context of Colossians here. Because it's that peace of Christ with him as the head. You see, if you're walking by a different head than somebody else, then you're going to have trouble getting along with that individual because you get different ideas, different directions. But if you all have that same head, then you have peace. You're all taking orders from the same head, Christ. He's the head of the body. So you let that peace of Christ dwell in you. How? Richly. Uh, I'm in the wrong way. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let it rule in your hearts. To the which also ye are called in two bodies, four, eight. One body. One body. You're called the one body, so now you... Let that peace rule in your hearts to the which you're called in that one body. You know, if we all walk by that one head, then we'd let that peace rule, not only in our individual lives and minds, but also in the whole body of Christ. Then you'd have unity. Okay. And be ye what? Thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. How? Richly. Let the word of Christ, or the word as it pertains to Christ, dwell in you richly where have, have you got it in here spiritually sure you do christ in you right now you've got to let that word dwell in your mind how do you do that by just sitting around and going into a trance no <laughs> you've got to study god's word study the word of christ the word pertaining to christ put it on in your mind see and you don't do it by osmosis you've got to read it study it make it your own like we're doing here tonight you read god's word when i was in school i had to work hard to understand some of those subjects and especially it was a new subject to me but i knew i had to learn it so i put in the necessary brain energy to do it and here you've got christ or the word of god now you've got to study this word to the end, you know, if you've never been acquainted with it before, to the end that it makes sense, if you want it to. But if you're not concerned, you know, then all the horses in the world couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. So, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So if you don't want the word, fine. But if you want God's word, it's here, and it's simple. I enjoy reading the word. I get excited about it. Some of the rest of you do, too. I know you do. Okay. I get more excited about this than I do ball games. <laughs> Let the word pertaining to Christ 
dwell in you richly. Look at those words. Then there should be a comma. The King James is mispunctuated here. And it should read, in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another. The in all wisdom goes with the next phrase in the Greek. You teach and you admonish one another or confront one another in what? Wis what wisdom? The wisdom of your senses or the wisdom of the word? God's word. And then another comma after another. And it should read, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You sing with grace in psalms, which are songs of praise, and hymns, and spiritual songs. That's how you sing in your hearts to the Lord. But at any rate, it's that word of Christ that has to dwell in you richly that gives you a means for teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom and that gives you a reason to sing spiritual songs or psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 3. With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the what? Mystery of Christ, that mystery pertaining to Christ, for which I am also in bonds. He happened to be in jail in Rome at the time that he wrote this epistle, but or in bonds, in chains. But he's still saying, you just pray God that he'd open a door of utterance that I can have some opportunity to speak God's word. And what did he want to speak? That mystery. And what's the riches of the glory of that mystery? That you've got Christ in you. You've got the head in you. Christ in you. To speak the mystery of Christ or that mystery pertaining to Christ for which I am also in bond. So what if you get there? You know, we've. Now, I don't think any of us have gone to jail in this culture because of it. He did in that particular culture. Real thankful for our country. You know, it's not every country in the world today that you can live as free as we live here. Back in the first century, they had a few problems. They'd go into certain cultures, they'd be thrown in jail. You know, and that's one thing it says in Timothy to pray for, our people in authority in the government circles, that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Well, we aren't in bonds like he was, but he still spoke the word and he still prayed for a door of utterance to speak it even more. Look at Colossians 2 again, verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him, in Christ. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily bodily dwells in Christ. Now look at it. We just read that we have Christ where? In us. That's what gives us that completeness. But it says the fullness of that Godhead. Hey, look at that. What did I say was a key concept in Colossians? Head. <laughs> God is the head over all. Christ is the head of that body. But God, the fullness of the Godhead, dwells where? In Christ. And that word dwell that's used here means to take up a permanent residence in. <laughs> it's different from another word that's used there. But to live permanently, to dwell in, to live in, that fullness of that Godhead bodily dwells in Christ. And Christ is where? in you, and that's why it says in verse 10, then you are complete, filled to capacity in Christ, which is the head of all Prince Pounding Power. Boy, these verses are jam-packed, loaded. God dwells in Christ. Christ dwells in you, and that's what gives you that completeness. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to be back to Colossians, but I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 11. 
Verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is whom? Now this is written to the church, talking about the church. Christ is the head of every man. He's the head, the one head. And the head of the woman is what? The man in the husband and wife relationship. And the head of Christ is whom? That's what I, we just read in Colossians. God is the head over all. And the fullness of that Godhead bodily dwells in Christ. Then it says Christ is the head of every man in the church. And it said in Colossians, it's Christ where? That's the riches of the glory of the mystery. So you got the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelling in Christ and Christ dwelling in you. Boom. Boom. You talk about power, and most Christians don't realize the power they have in this day and time. They have, like Timothy says, that form of godliness without really knowing the power that they have. We are loaded with so much power. The fullness of... What did God do? Have you, do you know anything that he did? I mean, did he make this earth that we're sitting on? How about the stars? He's dwelling in Christ in you. You think that gives you a little power in your life? Think you ought to walk around with your tail between your legs, feel frustrated? No. No, you ought to feel on top of the world. Walk down the sidewalk like you own it. You're ready to buy the other one on the other side of the street. The head of Christ is God. Look at 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 5, this is a good one, 17, therefore, if any man be where? In Christ, Christ, you've got Christ in you, now to be in Christ would be to be in fellowship with him, to walk with him, and that Christ in you is a new creature, it says, sounds like something in one of those horror film, outer space thing, you know what I'm talking about. It's new creation. <laughs> Creature is creation. That Christ in you is the new creation. So if you are in Christ, a new creation, the he is is in italics. You see that in your King James? That means it's been supplied by the translators, and it shouldn't be there. If any man be in Christ, a new creation, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of whom? God. As you're in Christ, as you walk with it, you've got it on the inside, it's all new in there, but now it becomes new in your walk, as you walk it. All thi- then all things are of God. I guarantee you, all things that happen out in the world are not of God. That's right. And a lot of people blame a lot of things, death and sickness, They blame on God. The word says it's of the devil. God's here to deliver the believer from those things. Don't blame God for it. All all things in the believer as he's walking in Christ are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and he's given to us the what? The ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of bringing others back to God. To wit, or to know, that God was where? In Christ. He was in Christ. God was in Christ. And Christ is where? Okay. But God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the word, the word of reconciliation. Not only do you have the ministry, you have the word to carry it out. That word of reconciliation so that you can bring others to God. Now then, we are ambassadors. Ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled to God. What does an ambassador do that goes to another country? He says, look, I want you to be reconciled to the United States. If you're an ambassador to England, or to, you know, let's say England, Great Britain, You'd say, as a representative of this country, if we got a few conflicts, a few disagreements, we want you to be reconciled to the United States. 
Perhaps it'd be better to pick an example like one of the Iron Curtain countries. If you went to one of those, you as the ambassador would do everything you could to get those people to come together with the United States, to agree, or at least to get along with, if nothing else. See? Be reconciled to. That's the function of an ambassador. And we are ambassadors for whom? Christ. And we've got the ministry and we've got the word to reconcile others, not to another nation, not to the United States, but to Christ and to God. With one head of the body, Christ, and the head overall, God, who's in Christ, who's in you. Now that gives you some power. What a, what a word, huh? How about back to Colossians? Chapter 1. Some of these things are foundational. But you can never forget what you have in Christ. The greatness of that power that you have. Colossians 1, 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the, the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ where? In you, the hope of glory. So you've got that head, Christ, in you. Whom we preach, confronting, warning is confronting every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man incomplete, imperfect, no, perfect. To present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of what? The mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, the, some of the manuscripts read more accurately the mystery of Christ, the mystery as it pertains to Christ, just like in Colossians chapter 4 that we read a while ago. Then in whom should be in which are hid all the treasures. You see, in that mystery that pertains to Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The treasures. Do you know how great that mystery really is? If all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in it? Pretty powerful. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. They try to get you away from the knowledge of this mystery. But look here. For though I be absent of flesh, yet I'm with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith or believing in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, well, how have you received it? Are you complete? You got everything you need. You have everything on the inside that you need spiritually. You have God in Christ in you. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so you do what? Walk, walk, walk. That's when you have power in your life, ye and him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Then verse 8, look at this. Beware, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of whom? Men. <laughs> Men have a lot of traditions, but they're not always built on God's Word. Philosophy, not always built on God's Word. Beware, it says, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after the one head, Christ. For in him, Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God is head over all. And that fullness dwells in Christ. 
and ye are complete, filled to capacity, absolutely complete with everything that you need, all enablement, which is the head of all principality and power. So you've got Christ, the head of the body, in you, and that's what gives you that perfect, total completeness. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 13, for it is God which worketh where? Not in your preacher, not in your neighbor, not in your grandparents. No, I mean, he might have been in them too, but he's in where? You. <laughs> God is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He's working there. God in Christ, the fullness of that Godhead bodily. And Christ where? In you. That gives you the power that you need to do everything that's necessary. Philippians 4, verse 13. That's why you can say, like this says in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through whom? Christ, which strengthens me, who infuses me with that inner strength I can do it through him. I can't do it of my own sense, knowledge, ability, or my own philosophy, or the traditions of men, but I can do it through Christ, who strengthens me, who infuses me with inner strength. I have the ability. Why? Because it's God, all the fullness of the Godhead, bodily dwelling in Christ, and Christ in you. You've got the head of the body in you, and that gives you the power and ability to do some things today, to help one another. You've got everything you need. You're absolutely complete in him. You're a son of God, the scripture says. You're a son of God, born again of his spirit. You've got seed, eternal life. Can you lose seed? No, you can't change the seed. You can change your name, but you can't change your seed. And when you're born again of spiritual seed, you can't change it. It's eternal life. You're born again, heaven, heaven bound. You're a son of God, not the son of God, that's Jesus Christ, but it says you're a son of God because he paved the way, he made it available for you to be born of God's seed. Are you still in your sins? No, you've got remission of sins, remember? <laughs> Are you accepted? He made you accepted with the beloved. He's made you accepted, so you're accepted. You're not an outcast, you're not a loner. You belong to a special group, God's group. You've got remission of sins. You've got forgiveness on a day-by-day -day basis as you blow it here and there. <laughs> so you get back in fellowship with God. But you've got remission of all your past sins. He's made available. You have righteousness? Yes. He made you righteous. He, made, he sanctified you, set you apart. He give you, gave you the ministry of reconciliation. Gave you justification. Gave you wisdom. All those things, those are all your sonship rights. You have everything you need. You're complete in him. Besides that, you just don't have it on the inside. You have the ability to walk by it. You've got nine manifestations of the Spirit. You've got speaking in tongues, interpretation, prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, faith, miracles, and healing to operate some power in your life today, right? Nine manifestations of that Holy Spirit that you have on the inside, that Christ in you. Besides that, you've got the nine fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, and temperance. All those things that are the result of walking by those nine manifestations of the Spirit. You've got every enablement that you need to be a power-packed Christian believer in this day and time. You're absolutely complete in Him. Isn't that wonderful to know? Boy, we ought to act like it instead of talking, you know, other directions where we're defeated, frustrated, or, you know, like so many Christians talk today. You wouldn't want to be a Christian when you see them. No, we're sons of God, loaded, filled with all of his goodness, and ready to walk with him, and we've got nine power-packed manifestations to walk by, and we can produce signs, miracles, and wonders, just like Jesus Christ did, just like Moses did, just like David did just like all the prophets of the Old Testament. How about Peter, Paul in the first century, and the others? 
We've got that same power and ability. We've got the same Christ in us that Paul had, that Peter had, that all the other Christians of the first century had if we just believe what God's Word says about us, that we are complete in Him, and then walk by it. So, Father, thank You for Your power and ability and that we can know Your Word and walk by Your Word in this day and time. Thank You for loving us, giving us the victory through Your Son, Jesus Christ, that we can walk with that power, knowing for a surety that we are absolutely complete, completely complete in Him in this day and time. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. God filled me with his spirit from above Someday we're gonna reign with him on high We'll meet him in the sky In the twinkling of an eye And every man a just reward Why not believe his word Why not make it your own Why not keep his word And make it your heart's own And you know he'll never Leave you Alone I'm telling you God will make a way Where there is no way You'll see the darkest sure you can trust his word his word is true and that stands in our day and time next week reverend bob moynihan will be teaching here on release from your prisons reverend martindale will be back in two weeks and don't forget i'll be signing books 20 minutes after if you want one signed okay all right ted let's close with on my way to heaven i'll be shoved around no i shall not be moved that's the way it goes let's stand oh.